And I think we're ready to move on to our next panel. So we will be talking about um, the digital as the new economy. And uh, to introduce the panel, I'm glad to introduce Pekka Pärnänen, who's, uh, as we heard on the previous panel, uh, you know, Estonia and Finland are kind of in the middle of Eurasia, and uh, the other centrum is somewhere across the seas in Silicon Valley. So you're sort of going back and forth. So where, do you, where are you mostly based these days? So I'm there, I've been there over 18 years. So it's one of those stories that, you know, you take a startup and go to Silicon Valley, stay there for two years. That's what I sold to my family. And after 18 years and no hair, I'm still there. And Matt Partners, you found it in Silicon Valley. Yeah, it's a boutique business development company and uh, working with startups from the Nordics and Baltics. So the company's name is Mad Partners. My tagline is nothing's crazy enough. So, you know, you never know what kind of companies you work with. But I, I can tell you, at least it's fun. And I know you're also crazy about ice hockey. Of course. So hockey which is, is the best place for ice hockey? Is it, uh, is it the uh, San Jose Sharks or Finland or, well, Estonia? I don't think it's doing too yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, of course, Finland is one of, you know, last championships. We didn't do that good, but that'll, you know, get better. Uh, but, you know, my heart is beating for San Jose Sharks, of course. But, you know, still waiting for the big, you know, final for those guys as well. Okay, Becca, the stage is All yours. All right, thank you. So I'd like to uh, get my panelists up here, um, and then we can continue. If, if you just take a seat, and then um, I'll do a little intro. I don't know how well I do, but then, you know, let's see what happens there. So the title is The uh, Digital is the New Economy. Um, so I was thinking about that. Of course, we want to touch a whole bunch of stuff, but what is digital economy? To me, it sounded like, you know, what's computer? Uh, what's internet? It used to be in the early times that the internet age is here, and it didn't mean anything, or then it meant everything. So we try to figure out all this now here, um, and then in the late, we do some questions here, but then I also encourage you to think about questions. I will have time for those. So in the, uh, the Nordics have been pretty good um, in, in digital economies, if you will. Uh, Estonia is the poster child for everything uh, for that. Um, and that's fascinating. Uh, in the EU's, it was called um, Digital Economy and Society Index. So the top countries uh, uh, in the EU are Denmark, Finland, and Sweden. And this index was looking into the um, like connectivity, human capital and digital skills, use of internet by citizens, integration with digital technology and businesses and, and public services and all that. Globally, you know, we already heard, you know, Singapore is one of those countries. We have UK, US, Hong Kong, Canada, Korea, Australia, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of stuff happening, and this is kind of fascinating times, uh, you know, from that perspective. Uh, so we want to talk about government here, uh, since we have, you know, good representative of the government here. Its role, legislation, and the uh, policies. Also business, uh, you know, are the big companies evil? What, what are the startups doing? Uh, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and also individuals. Uh, Probably remember, um, some of you are younger, but you know, 1983, the police song, every breath you take, every move you make, every step you take, I'll be watching you. <laughs> so that's one of those things that, you know, privacy and all the security and all that kind of stuff. I think, you know, the band Sting also, you know, 1983, we were not in the digital economy, but I mean, that's some of those things that we kind of worry about nowadays. And then, you know, it's all good, the, uh, it's a digital, it's a nice enabler, but it can also be divider. So if you look at the uh, developed countries and the uh, emerging countries, also cities and rules, even though now we know there's a place like 20 kilometers from Tallinn, which will be the center of the digital economy, you know, soon. Uh, but also the educated and non-educated. So there's a lot of things that, you know, do we use it for the good or do we use it for the bad? 
So those are the things that we'll be discussing here. So I'll do a little intros to the panel, um, and I start with you, Tavi. So Tavi is a member of the parliament in Estonia, ex-prime minister of the Estonia, um, and, and that time was the youngest uh, uh, leader in the European leader uh, from that perspective. And in that sense, so he's been driving the, uh, the poster child here, uh, so we want to talk about that. Uh, so everybody knows Tavi here in Estonia and in Europe, but I think that he became pretty famous attending the Daily Show uh, about a year ago, because Trevor Noah, the, the host, was asking Tavi that the, uh, so Jeb Bush has been bracing about Estonia that he can do taxes in five minutes. So Tavi's answer was that, yeah, we upgraded this now three minutes. But and that's I'll a try it once more, by the way. That's what I'm thinking. So it's a one minute, and you know, and probably you know, there's no taxes soon. So you know, what do we know? Um, and then also said that you know, you have to go. You know, let's all get to go and go to Estonia. So we are here. So we try to figure out what what is this all digital economy. And then we have Alan Devlin uh, from E. Invest from Dublin, Ireland, and the. Uh, Alan and, and Ida briefs everything digital. Um, so these guys are investing, but also uh, working on the apps in the digital, and then advising VCs in, in that perspective. And you have a long history, you know, almost when the digital started, you know, yeah. <laughs> not to give up your age at the moment. Well, well 42. Well, <laughs> now you know. <laughs> yeah, I started in 96, and literally I was explaining what the internet was, and then I was explaining what uh, Wi-Fi was, what mobile was, what social media was, and here we are, digital economy, we're explaining, we're not explaining what it is anymore, it's what's the impact to yeah. uh, society in general. So uh, I used to be a, uh, a, a, a consultant, I had a digital agency, and my whole life was a fight. It was, you know, fight to get the deal, fight to get the job done, fight with the client to pay. This job is completely different, so we're, we're investing in uh, startups. Uh, people are really optimistic, they've got great ideas, and you know, it's extremely positive. Doing it for two years and really, really enjoying it. Yeah. So, the guy hands-on in digital, um, as ha hands-on you can be in the, you know, ones and zeros, right? Exactly. Um, and then we have Maria Pianar from Johannesburg, uh, South Africa. And the, uh, Maria is a co-founder of Blue Label Ventures, which is an uh, investment and accelerator uh, company over there, looking into the startup and growth companies and getting them into the international markets. Um, before that, uh, she was the CIO for uh, Cell C, which is an operator in, in South Africa. And then she's been also working uh, in Silicon Valley, helping Finnish companies to get into the Silicon Valley with FinPro, history also with Nokia and Global Star, and also you have to, she was one of the first founder teams getting Vodafone um, to South Africa, the first uh, operator really entering that. So really early stage, exp hands-on experience, what does it mean when you bring digital you know, to the uh, emerging countries? Anything you want to add? I just want to say, I had the same experience, go to Silicon Valley for two years and end up being there 17. <laughs> yeah, so. that happens, there's some <laughs> pattern there, so, yeah. Um, and last but not least, uh, we have Ivan Virakovic, who is a uh, director of digital transformation for Microsoft. So, representing a uh, bigger company, uh, looking into the uh, digital transformation and, you know, what will happen. Uh, He's based in Zagreb in, in Croatia, but handles a lot of parts of, of Europe. Um, also was a, a country manager uh, for Microsoft in Croatia. Um, and then long history working with IBM uh, in the sales responsibilities in Croatia and Middle East. Also, I found out that um, you were also president of Croatian American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, for quite many years, and a member of a Croatian National Competitiveness Council for seven years. Yes. Anything you want to add? Only that I'm also 42. Like, <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm 42, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always. All right. 
So let's kick this off and start going. So one of the things what I want to ask all of you guys, and we did agree that we don't have to agree. So that's one of those things. So, you know, we can be as controversial as we want. Uh, so, you know, there's no, you know, little written deal here. Um, so I would like you to pitch now and, and tell that the, um, how do you contribute to the advancement of the digital economy in your capacity? And that can be, you know, your country or your, you know, the, the you know, region that you work with or, or you know, the, the companies that you do. So I'll start with you, Tali. Well, thank you very much for this chance. Uh, if there's something in life that I love is, is pitching for my country and, and there is a good reason for that. There is a lot to, to tell about. Now, you were right to say that Estonia has been a kind of poster child of digital development. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, very modestly, as, as we are Estonians, uh, I think you were <laughs> perfectly right. Uh, now, the main difference, uh, you know, we have analyzed it many, many times over and over again. The main difference with many other countries is that uh, you know, at the beginning of the century, we wanted to make the government as efficient as possible. And, and we didn't hesitate um, starting using uh, some of the most critical things that are necessary to make it happen. Mm. So without those cornerstones of the digital development, it would be very, very difficult to go as digital as we have gone. Uh, but with those cornerstones, actually, you could argue that Estonia is far from being uh, uh, where our potential is. So we still are kind of scratching the top of an iceberg uh, in terms of what can be done with yeah. those cornerstones. And those cornerstones, you know, I'm not telling a big secret, are uh, secure and, and uh, easy to use digital identity, which uh, anyone can make sure over the internet that this is really you that is on the other <coughs> side. And, and secondly, of course, interoperability between uh, a different um, uh, private and public information systems, which makes it possible. So this one. This is the ID, yes, so yep. you, can, you can use. Uh, uh, so Finnish American can use that, it's in Estonian in, ID, I love in, it. In America, <laughs> in Johannesburg, wherever you can use it, you only need um, uh, internet connection. Unfortunately, you know, we, we're still in the beta phase with the, with the uh, e-residency card, so we don't have so many uh, services yet, but uh, it's already possible for you to run your holding company uh, without even visiting uh, Estonia. Having said that, of course, all of you who are not from Estonia, you're perfectly welcome to visit as well. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's do this time like we do the role, then we change that. Um, Alan. Um, okay, so uh, we spotted that there was a hell of a lot of great ideas coming out of Ireland. Uh, this was fostered from a very successful foreign direct investment program, which brought the vast majority of very large uh, US software companies into Ireland. They obviously provide a lot of training, and um, I think uh, the, uh, the education system in Ireland delivers a, a high level of innovation, not to mention the pub culture. So, you know, with a few Guinnesses <laughs> is always a good way to come up with a good app. Um, so we noticed that there was a lack of early stage investment. Um, it was fine once you, were, uh, once you were trading, you were doing well. Uh, so we kind of spotted that uh, between sort of seed and early stage, it was extremely difficult to get investment quickly, quickly enough to get the idea off the ground. It was very government focused. Uh, the uh, the EI, EI Enterprise Ireland are very good, but because they're a government organization, unlike yours, to be honest, which seems very dynamic, uh, <laughs> ours is a little bit slower. So uh, our, our focus is essentially on uh, making sure that good ideas are getting the funding they need. Uh, our business, uh, we've got five directors. Of the five directors, there's one corporate finance, which is unusual for a venture capitalist firm. Everybody else is heavy end tech, so we're very hands-on. Um, mm. Our argument is we've made every mistake, or a lot of mistakes you can make over the last 20 years, and we're trying to help our companies we're investing in not make those mistakes and accelerate them thus far. Yeah. Right. Maria. So, um, from a South African perspective, so I had the privilege of both working in an extremely developed country like the US and in Silicon Valley where there's just a, a lot of different companies and startups and there's the exciting um, startups in there, very mature, very good skill sets going into a place like Africa. And 
also working from a corporate perspective. So when I was at CELC, a lot of the digital economy drive, now the one advantage we had in South Africa is that the digital economy was driven really from the start of the mobile industry. With mm. the success we had with different types of premium rated services with SMS, connecting people to do um, trade um, just through a simple platform like SMS. And then now um, you see more and more applications um, popping up as well and entrepreneurs doing some interesting things. Um, on the corporate side, a lot of the focus was how do we drive more operational efficiency. So in South Africa, the banking industry is actually leading a lot of the, mm. the, the new um, digital drives and, and with obviously with financial fintech services to start driving financial inclusion. From a Blue Label Ventures perspective, um, there is a big need in, in, in the South African um, startup market to really look at how do we scale and grow these companies. There's a lot of corporate incubation funding available, but not in the early growth stage and how to take that out into African and other markets. And that's where we're focusing. Mm -hmm. Ivan, you wanna? Thank you. And just to say hello to everybody, beautiful Tallinn, first time in Estonia. <laughs> I'm really enjoying the time. So my current job is uh, to accelerate the incubation of digital technologies and help customers uh, in their transformation journey, but also help partners and help Microsoft employees. Microsoft is 100,000 plus uh, employee company and I can tell you any transformation is tough. It's easy to talk about transformation, but culture change takes mm. time. Yeah. And uh, for me to be successful, I really need to do all three. Uh, partners also, we see that we will have to rely heavily on, on partners that we don't know yet because time of uh, you know, three-year renewals is over because customer want fast uh, uh, solutions. Mm. Customer wants to pay for service eventually for three months, not for three years. So this mental shift is really uh, important. So if you would ask me what my primary job is really to attract ISVs, companies like startups that see a niche in some of the areas and that we recognize then which segment, which industry, which customers yeah. require those. It's called today consumption. And yeah. there is a good group, uh, book uh, from JD, uh, uh, JD something, Woods, JD Woods, Consumption Economics. Uh, and it talks about change in, in IT industry. Most of you here are connected to IT industry. What the guy said is that industry is changing from uh, IT companies selling complex IT solutions to customers to now uh, uh, selling successful business outcomes to business decision makers. Mm. It's huge difference. No more complexity in the IT, but lots of requirements on the, on the ex executive level. And by the way, those requirements are really, can arrive from industry, from process, could be vertical, could be horizontal. And people to switch from supporting partners to sell infrastructure solutions mm. to fixing, for example, customer experience uh, management or, or manufacturing customer journey, it's totally different language, it's totally different sure. experience. So it's very interesting, it's exciting, and the you know, digital transformation is all over yeah. around okay. us. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll continue that thought, and I'm now looking at you, Tavi, because I mean, Estonia started in the sense from the scratch, which was good, uh, you know, there's no legacy there. Uh, you needed to make a decision. We heard earlier today that, you know, it's not the governments who developing the, you know, the innovation is happening with the, uh, with the companies uh, from that perspective. But what you just said, I'm, I'm, I'm interesting to hear that. Mm -hmm. How the mm -hmm. hell did you make the decisions what to use mm -hmm. <laughs> from, well, from that perspective? You're starting from the scratch and you got mm -hmm. everybody's, when you say that I'm buying, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of guys who's selling you a whole mm -hmm. bunch of stuff. So, I mean. Well, I think actually governments can be innovative. And, and the, when you are in government, you don't need to stop being uh, innovative as, as a person. So I think, uh, of course, most of the development in the economy, in the society, comes from uh, private companies, comes from the guys who actually are not afraid to risk. And, and we have many of them here, uh, many Estonian startups, many, many uh, startups from abroad. So this is where innovation happens, but it can sometimes happen also in government if you're risk prone enough. Now, when I was... Um, a young civil servant back in the year 2000, my boss, who was Minister of Justice, uh, assigned me and, and um, uh, another colleague who now is the legal chancellor of Estonia, assigned to do the most crazy thing we can do 
in using the uh, digital uh, technology that we had just introduced, the, the electronic ID. Mm. And he said, look for the ways to start voting um, electronically. Uh, I will be very much lying if I said that we had some clue how to do that. <laughs> but five years later, we had not only the legislation, but the system working in this way that uh, you know, people could vote over the internet. And, and um, I think that was a good example of, of government innovation of, um, of uh, basically offering people some service in a different way. Uh, for example, those Estonians who live in, um, in South Africa, for them it's so much easier now to vote. Uh, they just have an internet connection and, and that's enough. That, so I mean, I'm jealous, in, you know, to my Estonian friends in Silicon Valley because they just, you know, post that I voted. <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's, that's just one thing. And, and I think we as government or as a society should not stop innovating. And the good ideas can very easily come also for private companies and I yeah. think, or, 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 you know, any citizen. I think we as citizens um, and we as politicians should demand more from the society. And that's not only about Estonia, but about... Uh, um, all countries. Uh, for example, uh, we should also learn from, um, from private uh, services. We actually have digitally working Europe uh, and digitally working world uh, when we book our hotel rooms. I can do it with my mobile phone here, Johannesburg, Zagreb, Silicon Valley. It's very easy. So, you know, we shouldn't <coughs> give ourselves this kind of lower standard for public mm. services. So my prescription should also work in Johannesburg, and, and uh, of course it is possible. Uh, nobody can convince me otherwise. I, I, I know for sure that it's possible. Okay, so kind of a little bit, you want to answer that something? Or? Um, I'm, fi I'm fine with this. Okay, so uh, I'm uh, picking you now, Maria, because I mean, you're looking into from that perspective. You were there pushing mobile, that there was the, the, the first chance for a lot of people mm -hmm. to do banking. Uh, for example, you know, based on the, you know, banking from non-bank, you know, unbanking uh, or bank people. So wh wh what's your take and what, what do you see now what's happening there, um, um, you know, in South Africa, but in Africa all, all over the place that, you know, what does a digital change really? So the, the digital, the, the key change it brings, it, it really gets people who never had access to services to now start participating and transacting. Now with that comes a whole slew of uh, different challenges. Um, you know, I had to, when I left the States and going back into South Africa, put my fraudster hat on again and think like a fraudster because we have some of the most creative social fraudpreneurs. And it comes back to also an identity. So a couple of key things. The first thing for me is you need to figure out how to open your business or your government services as a platform for the innovators to innovate on. But in a way, you need to secure it as well. Um, mm -hmm. In the South African milieu and African milieu, they will steal a digital identity faster than you can blink. Mm -hmm. um, so even at, Cel <laughs> even at Cell C, we had to come up with very creative ways on how we verify the, the identity of a person. Now, when you look at collusion-based fraud, you literally sit with fraudsters from system administration level all the way down to the guys on the street selling um, services based on some fraudulent mm -hmm. uh, scheme that they have. Uh, Tinder, f more than 50% of Tinder profiles in South Africa are fake. So how do you recognize that the person you're doing it? Now there's all sorts of peer-to-peer -peer ransom coming out. So our social fraud entrepreneurs are way ahead of any digital economy that I've ever seen in the mm. world. <laughs> but uh, mm. um, so it's important to look at how we deal with identity. But there is such creativity. I mean, you, you're starting to see examples now of um, one of the companies that I've seen to is beekeeping. Now, as everyone knows, you know, there's a big problem with bees globally. And in order to now to stimulate youth employment, there are companies now who's doing digital beehives where these guys are now um, out there to produce honey and, and uh, grow a healthy bee population all over the country where they also can participate in how they sell through a digital platform the honey. 
Now, those opportunities never would have existed without a good, strong mobile infrastructure. And it's a good thing in South Africa, we have 110% mobile penetration. So that's what you mentioned about those, uh, the B thing. And it's kind of like the old co-op that yes. you have little farmers bringing everybody to this big place and then you know they, they're selling them with the common price and everybody gets their money. So. Yeah, and, and, and the good thing that comes from that is there's a lot of, I would say, easy business model as well with how you can charge for these premium rated type of services. Now, the other important thing that happens in the mobile economy, about 90% of the market is prepaid. Distribution mm. is the other thing on mm. how you transact and where you buy mm. things. That is so prevalent down to three people away from you in the street, mm. in the South African context, even in the most rural. Now, part of the challenge is how do we take that into more digital currency move, um, because it's still expensive to take physical cash into um, a, a, a digital currency that can then enable that further. So identity distribution and then also the ability to get the cash into a virtual to virtual or digital cash and then transact with a cheap transactional mechanism mm. is of, I would say three of the key things on how we can mm. really enable inclusion of people to participate in that. Alan, any thoughts on that? Uh, totally agree with that. We've got a we've got a big problem in Ireland with uh, digital di uh, digital identity stuff. Uh, you still have to sign things and you know open up a bank account, do anything, do your taxes. Still have to sign stuff. Still have to send physical stuff. So what you guys have put together is amazing. Um, I think a lot of countries, even the Western world, are struggling with this. And a lot of it's down to legislation. Uh, a lot of it's also down to uh, lack of inclusion within between governments mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and corporate entities. Mm. I think that's one of the major problems that's, that faces both Europe and, and Africa. Mm -hmm. actually, actually, I fully agree with the point that it all comes down to legislation and uh, recognizing the way to identify people over internet. You, know, you talked about uh, banks uh, being innovators, and, and I, I fully agree in this. Uh, also, a big part of Estonian digital identity was uh, done in cooperation with the banks. But also, the banks or, or the financial sector has made this innovation that we call the credit card, which helps each mm. and every one of us buy things from any internet store there is. So basically, this is one format of, of digital economy, not a particularly secure one, Let's be honest, uh, you could do it much, much more secure way, but basically it is there. The world has agreed that we can buy things mm. in Estonia from you know, any, any shop there is uh, globally. Now, the thing that we have to do is, is politically agree on a um, similar thing to identify people and, and also to sign documents. You know, I would argue that most people in the uh, room have never seen my handwritten signature. Have you? Okay, you have. Okay. <laughs> you have an autograph, uh, probably. <laughs> because you know, when I was in office as prime minister, I only I only signed uh, diplomas and autographs uh, with my uh, a pen. All the official signatures I gave using my mobile ID, mm. and this is the way. You know, I, I was no exception. This is the way all the Estonians in the room uh, do that. And, and I would argue that uh, signing things digitally where you also have the timestamp, uh, knowing that you know, when I sign, which might be very important in some cases, all of the lawyers in the room know exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. And, and uh, once we have this more secure way of signing things, you in, in uh, your office, you in your office, they might be 10,000 kilometers away, they can have transactions. Mm. And, and you know, Estonians don't want to keep this thing a secret. We don't want to keep the digital identity for ourselves. We, kind of want to share it with the world and, and actually uh, benefit uh, all to, to, you know, we're kind of uh, tired to be alone, uh, to be this poster <laughs> kid. We wanted all the world to use it because I think there is a huge business case uh, in terms of efficiency and, and this goes equally both to private and public sector. Yeah. So yeah, now since, yeah. you know, you guys own Skype, so how do you help the, the rest of the um, uh, uh, Estonia to get this to to all over the place. That's simple. Okay. That's simple. <laughs> okay. Really, I mean, no worries. When two parties agree, it's very simple. <laughs> but I, I wanted to add something else. Uh, when, when you send the title of the roundtable, you know, digital economy, I, I was a bit caught by surprise because it's so outdated. 
Uh, and then I was, oh, really, and then I was thinking, you know, where's the catch? And then I realized, okay, yes, EU, when you look end-to-end, -end, holistic, yes, you need mm. government, you need policies, mm -hmm. you need infrastructure, you need human resources. But today, the key word is digital transformation. So what's the difference between digital economy and digital transformation? If you look at the definition in Wikipedia, what is digital transformation? Is the change associated mm. with the application. Mm. So when we talk about digital economy, usually people talk about digitization, process automation, we take analog processes, put mm. them in digital, we do incremental uh, uh, increase in, in, in operational efficiency in productivity, but digital transformation is really uh, not about it. The, the major term is called disruption. And if you look at, you know, already misused uh, Uber, Airbnb, etc., mm. they are destroying the industry as, as we know it today. And I really found one very interesting cartoon. There is a taxi driver looking at the rear mirror, and behind him was Uber guy driving. A Uber driver is looking at the mirror. There is a car without a driver. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the, the pace of change mm -hmm. is such that we really forget what's going on. For example, top 500 companies, Fortune 500 companies in the US, the ones that existed in 1955, 88% yeah. don't exist anymore. What is the now forecast? Uh -huh. Top 500 companies today, 2027, in 10 years, 75 of them will not exist, or at least not in this shape. Yeah. And we are talking about companies that are making $27 trillion today. Yeah. So it tells you, th this is why government is so important. Government cannot run, legislation cannot run at the pace of technology change, uh -huh. but can create environment hmm. to incent and, and promote entrepreneurship, professional approach, uh, innovation, uh, because innovation drives economy. And when you look what is the top currency of the world today, people forget, it's called job opening. Because every year in the world, certain number of jobs are open. Maybe they're in Estonia, maybe they're in the United States, maybe they're in, in Vietnam. The country that's the best in applying policies, driving costs down, incenting innovation, pushing startups, will get those jobs. Lots of politicians don't understand this. Estonia does understand. Mm -hmm. And from Croatia, I really envy you, because today I've heard the term forward-thinking politicians. Mm -hmm. Usually politicians are thinking, you know, how I incent with some social, I call it social corruption, give money to people to vote for me for tomorrow. But you have to be brave. Sometimes you have to risk, maybe lose elections for four years, come back, and you see what I did was right. It, it was painful. It cost, it hurt. But now you see the difference between leader and manager. You know, manager does the things mm. right. A leader does the right things. Mm. Maybe he or she loses elections, but then people say, wow, we didn't know this. So next time, please lead us. Well, th that, is, that is the one thing that seems to be missing in a lot of political structures mm. is a long-term vision. Um, a lot of politicians are looking, well, looking at a four-year or five-year structure and what they can achieve in that period of time. And I think uh, governments really need to look at a 10-year or a 20-year structure. We do quite a lot of work uh, with, with Chinese investors and the Chinese economy, and they've got a 100-year plan, and you can see it. You know, they're, they're investing for 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road. And I think the Western Europe needs to change that uh, very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And you guys clearly had a vision for that and took a risk, and over a period of time, you're seeing the results of that. I recently had a talk with the Finnish Minister of Transportation, Anna Berner. She, I was so impressed. She is pushing forward a law uh, that is um, kind of technology independent in, in a way the uh, public transportation mm. is organized. So meaning technology independent means that uh, it doesn't matter. It can equally be for buses, for uh, mm. drones, for UFOs, whatever, you know, tele <laughs> teleportation probably. So basically it, it's, it's not stuck in the mm. four wheels. It's stuck in the way that, uh, you know, how to give a condition for, for people to move. And, and this is one example of what the regulation should be like, because you are perfectly right saying that most of the countries, um, probably that includes even all countries, I would argue, um, are um, kind of lagging behind in terms of um, how to cope with technology. Uh, it's actually kind of horrifying to see that uh, how many countries are um, afraid of companies like Uber or, uh, or Taxify or Airbnb. But mm. come on, this is not to be afraid of. This is something that mm. will be there anyways, and you can kind of postpone it in your country, but it, then you will be late for the next level development. You know, in this particular room, it's kind of good to remember that uh, 
people were against, um, uh, or some people were against uh, electricity and steam engines uh, also, <laughs> because they were afraid. And I think today it would be not very wise to be against um, technology. Uh, it would not be very wise to kind of con be concerned about uh, uh, not having bus drivers in a couple of decades. Yes, we can be concerned, but we shouldn't kind of prohibit from, uh, from uh, giving us this development. We just have to cope with that fact that there won't be bus drivers in a couple of decades. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, and th just a quick note to that. I mean, I was a few years back in, in one of the um, uh, some seminar and, and somebody said that, um, you know, technology is something that was developed after you are 10. <laughs> So everything else we take for granted, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I was a kid, you know, that time we had already TVs, and that was, you know, it was not technology. Uh, but my dad was still, when he was older, he was always aiming, you know, the remote control. <laughs> Before that, I was the remote co control. He would smack me and, you know, change the channel. That time you have <coughs> two channels in Finland, that was easy. Uh, but, but in, you know, but that's, that's some of the things that you, you get, you know, everything new. Uh, and I liked in the morning, there was, you know, it's not teaching the kids, but mm -hmm. you know, how do you have the older generation part of this? Because they get divided even faster than we think. Because mm -hmm. uh, nobody's teaching them unless we're doing the job you know, with our parents. And, and also that falls back in with the whole digital transformation. It's not just government uh, legislation that need to change. And I'm <laughs> fully in agreement with you, Alan. I think if we really want to drive fintech services and financial inclusion, Unless we solve the way and disrupt the way that the FICA processes and the RICA processes happen in some countries, mm. which is your SIM card registration processes, you're just stifling that pipeline. And if you actually look at the legislation or the rules why those things were put in place, where you have to have a physical agent now verify your identity, which quite likely can be stolen as well, yeah. um, it adds such a barrier of entry to be able to enable innovation mm. that this is why we haven't really seen the mobile monies and the wallets and those things really take off in the way that, uh, mm. that we wanted because there has to be some policies and it's quite interesting to see what the cryptocurrencies and the blockchain technologies are going mm. to do where now suddenly you have a global currency you can trade with and exchange yeah. with. Um, but from a company perspective, uh, it's the same barriers we see that even up to HR processes that certain policies need to try and change in companies like Microsoft. You know, this is now the other thing. If you look at how an employee gets onboarded for a verified identity in a corporation, it's done through an, a Microsoft email server or an LDAP directory. Now, what happens if that person you're trying to do is a robotic process? Now you're having interesting discussions with HR to say, hang on, now I've got 50 employees in my headcount, but 30 of them are robots. <laughs> And Microsoft is happy because they make license uh, fees on the 50 employees and things. So there's an interesting discussion as a CIO then on licensing fees. So we need to look at these end-to-end -end processes when we start disrupting and how we can be more flexible and agile from government level, from company policy levels, mm -hmm. from large vendor levels, that how we can create a platform that enables these changes to yeah. happen in more diverse ways. Right. Uh, I, I wanted to add... Uh, <laughs> how important it is, and I really spend a significant chunk of my time, even after work, talking to kids in elementary schools, in high schools, at universities, importance of education. Because what's happening today, I mean, I, I, for me, it's really funny to read, EU will lack 700,000 ICT skills, 900,000. If I was an EU regulator, I would, you know, limit democracy on, on the way, which kind of uh, universities you can apply for if I am paying the money. Because Technology is coming. We know the megatrends, you know, cloud, mobility, uh, big data, mm. social, and cybersecurity. This is happening, and this is happening at a very fast, uh, fast pace. Drones will alter the way we, we understand transport. Uh, 3D printing, today it's very normal, even in Croatia, that in, in a hospital, a patient comes with broken hip, you make 3D scan, print uh, on the spot part of the bone, and apply it. MIT is today producing, mm. working on 3D printers which will produce food. We are talking about robots. So in large companies, chatbots are normal. So you are talking to a robot. Why? 
because of this massive data that everybody collects, inclusive of sensors, you are able to add artificial intelligence. I would really like to see kids starting playing with robots in, in with two languages or three languages in, in a kindergarten. Unless we create this level of, of uh, education, I mean, we'll be talking about challenges, inability to cope, to pick up, and, and just, just to, to, to show you how fast it is happening. Again, I, I, I like data. Fortune 500 previously usually took them around 20 years to reach 1 billion uh, market value. Then came Google, eight years. Then came Facebook, six years. They came Uber, four years. By the way, unicorns, most of you know what unicorns are. Those are startups and companies that have potential to reach $1 billion. Average to reach $1 billion market value is four years. Mm. Airbnb, three years. Snapchat, Sh Xiao, uh, two years. So we are basically waiting for a company that okay, will one reach $1 billion market value in one year. And at the same time, you know, you are expecting government to, to work at the pace of uh, technology change. It, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. And, and just to add one more thing, uh, market is waiting for the first company that will reach $1,000 billion market value. All three Baltic countries plus Croatia, we are $150 billion. And then a company comes which has $1,000 billion market value. And then you start to think, you know, what, what the impact will be in future. And for that, legislation is the key. Who can do it? Government can do it. Can they do it alone? No, they cannot. So, so I really love what you are trying to do. Exchange experience, get experience back, make it bigger, not like we are here, Latvia is there, Denmark is there. Make it bigger and bigger because this is what makes sense. When you make economy of scale, you can really benefit. And then we can pick and choose where we want to be boutique countries. Croatia is for sure a good country for tourism. <laughs> Croatia has good startups, but we cannot do five or ten things. We can do three, four, and this is what small countries should do, you know, focus and executive. You know. So, so one of the things that I want to uh, touch, you know, everything is based on data nowadays. So data mm. is the new gold, new money, and, and all that kind of a stuff. But then the question is that, you know, who owns it? Um, uh, that's very interesting because, I mean, might be you guys and, you know, your, you know, other, you know, Googles, Facebooks, and whatnots, mm. and all that kind of a stuff. But in the, uh, and now we hear in the, uh, in the Nordics that it's a every man's land, you know, you know from that perspective, equal. So... And, and, you know, I should own it. Um, so, so I'd like to get your kind of a thoughts on that. You know, what's the role of the, of the government? Uh, what's the role of the, the bigger companies and whatnot? But then it's my data, and I should make something out of it. Um, you know, if I give it out to, you know, somebody and get better services. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts Look, on that? I, I mean, for me, one of the key things, again, is on the ownership is that as a consumer, you should own your digital identity and the data around that, and you should be able to determine what you're going to do with it and who you share with that. My view at the moment is when we look at the data structures and how we share data even between companies is, is too cumbersome with for the interest of that company, but when you go out there, actually, <laughs> your data has been sold off 20 yeah, yeah. times That's over. Um, over already, over even without your permission. So there's no real way of how you can track it. And one of the exciting things for me is looking at some companies who's now um, trying to do the data ownership on identity across different marketplaces. Yeah. And th those are the type of companies I'm very interested in because it can resolve part of it. So data, mm. you always need to look at what parts of it is confidential for that transaction to happen or even in a place of crime fighting. Yeah. So in South Africa with extreme high abuse, um, I'm involved in a project where we're now looking at using data and the reporting where people can report of crime mm -hmm. incidences or abuse incidences um, in order to help the police and the community to now come up with the strategies to f battle these incidences itself. The challenge, though, is if a person has been sexually abused, there's certain legislation processes that need to be captured, and that then needs to be part and parcel of that person reporting or someone else reporting mm. on how you deal with that. But the center for me there and key is going to be on that you as a consumer can own your yeah. ID, and it might sit across multiple platforms which you allow, 
coming also back to the digital IDs, but how you share that for whatever transaction you want to do with whatever entity or peer-to-peer -peer as well yeah. is um, should be in, in your control, not in another entity's mm -hmm. control. But in theory, we are there, but in practice, we are not. Um, yeah. I mean, good yeah. example from Finland. So, you know, all my medical records and, you know, we're behind, you know, you guys. <laughs> way behind, but uh, we're getting there, hopefully. <laughs> uh, you know, I have, you know, I own it, but there's no way to access this unless I go to the doctor and he or she looks at it from her or his machine and finds that. Uh, but well, I own it, and it's kind of like an eternal loan <laughs> kind of a scenario. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, to talk about all data, uh, um, it's very, very difficult to determine the, the ownership policies, obviously, and, and uh, you know, I learned the meaning of word cookie in the con computer science uh, meaning, uh, I think around uh, 93 or 94, and ever since I have had no illusion that, uh, that uh, what I do over the internet is, is, is somehow private. But, but having said that, uh, I think uh, the e-health is, is a very important um, uh, issue where the data has to be protected because it's extremely sensitive. Mm. And government has to keep a very high standards in, in uh, in how they deal with the data. Otherwise, uh, I think people will simply tell us that, uh, thank you, but we don't need your e-government. Uh, so that's a very, very mm. sensitive thing. Uh, also, of course, with, with e-voting, uh, no government official should never know whom I voted for. Mm. And we have a very, very strict uh, safety measure to guarantee that. Now, coming back to this um, um, electronic medical record, in Estonia, we have a nationwide. So I go to any hospital, any doctor can uh, look at my previous case summaries. And usually it's very positive because I don't need to, if I have a you know, bone fraction, I don't need to do the x-ray many times over and over. They just get the picture from the uh, previous hospital when, where it was mm -hmm. already done. And they can also see if I have had uh, something uh, before. So it's good for me. Now, if there is something sensitive, and that's something I would recommend um, uh, Finnish uh, system to do as well, uh, just listening to what you, you uh, described, we have the patient's portal, where mm -hmm. I as a patient can look at all the information the system has about me, and with one click I can close any case summary that doesn't have any mm -hmm. relevance um, uh, for my dentist, for example. And, and uh, secondly, if um, some celebrity uh, has uh, issues that uh, somebody snooping around uh, mm. in the health data and even publishing something, you can look at the logbook and, and mm. see for sure who was the one snooping around. And, and that's again another safety clause so that uh, we deter actually anyone snooping around too much because they mm. know that if they, they will get caught and they will be punished. So there is no point of committing the crime in the first place. So the data ownership. Yeah. Uh, before we go to the um, uh, questions. questions, for me, just the mic somewhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For me, it's a clear question. You know, are we talking about private or public sure. data? Private is mine. Public now, how do we define public? If I'm walking on the street and you have cameras in front of government building banks, yeah, that's not mine. Um, Facebook, <coughs> the largest Thanks. content company in the world, hmm. produces zero data. Everything is made by the user. Yeah. And what future is bringing, I mean, if you look at yourself as consumer, uh, you want to have personalized service. Uh, government wants to see each individual, what he or she contributes and what he or she spends. Uh, citizen wants to have personalized service by the government. Now, there will have to be some compromise. <clears throat> For example, I'm confident that some of us will want to be contacted by the shop when we are passing by and shop recognizes the face that just at that moment, mm. Levi's brought new type of shoes or uh, jeans or, or Zara brought something in, in my size or my wife's size. So, th you know, this privacy will be blurring, but for sure, uh, if somebody has good, good laws, it's EU, especially with GDPR, and it is maybe that EU is a little bit slow in, in, in uh, um, monetizing the data, because mm. only in January 2017, European Commission dis uh, delivered communication on uh, European data economy. You know, seeing how many uh, American companies are really using the data. By the way, there was a study a year plus ago uh, for EU 28 countries which said that the uh, value of open government data and, and big data in EU 28 countries is 206 billion euros. Mm. 
So that's basically potential. If you leave it outside, there will be lots of startups like you that will sit on data, produce new value. Yeah. And then you have to make decision, you know, is it public or private? But mm -hmm. I believe, at least in EU, the regulations is very strict. What you can do with your data, Mic in Microsoft, data is yours. Yeah. And we will allow you to track what's happening with data. We, we have nothing to do with it. Somebody else is analyzing your data without maybe names, but we'll look at your buying patterns and habits because yeah. they will sell your habits to, to potential sellers. Yeah. But in future, future obviously part of this privacy, I believe how it looks like will be, have to be given away, but also intentionally if you want to get personalized it, services. It depends yeah. what you want, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, but you, I, should, you should choose. You know. yeah. yeah, and I think people are happy if you can choose it um, yeah. and, and I get the, the services, value, uh, value know, back. Yeah. which is you know, yeah. valuable for me. There was, a, there was an interesting article in the uh, Washington Post, I think it was yesterday, about Google being able to track when you're buying stuff in bricks and mortar um, organizations without actually having any external data about what you're doing. So you go in, you purchase something in the store, and they can now say what you purchased, but not explaining how to do that. But you know, that seems a little bit invasive. Mm -hmm. um, would I, do I mind myself? Not really. I've given them my data. It's actually easier for me to get access to stuff. But I think it is important that you have the choice to opt out of that mm -hmm. if you want to. Yeah. All right. We have some time for questions. And the, uh, this is a, a huge topic, so we didn't have time to cover everything. So it's great that there's a you know, first one out there. Thank you. Um, I have one question. Uh, there is a startup. Uh, DocuSign in C uh, San Francisco, uh, they have raised about $500 million and they're doing rather primitive uh, document digital signing, I would say. So my question is, what is stopping Estonian digital signature from <laughs> spreading around the globe? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> well, That's if I question. might try to answer it, I, wish I remember a couple of years ago, um, um, my, my tweet went viral when I tried to explain Apple what digital signature actually is in a tweet. They, they just kind of had a picture of somebody's handwritten signature uh, kind of written on the, on the screen, uh, which is kind of so, so, so 90s. But uh, I think uh, <laughs> the only thing uh, um, uh, keeping this from going uh, viral, the digital signature, uh, the, like we have it in Estonia, going viral is... Um, uh, political uh, will. Um, there are different um, issues uh, what deter politicians. In some cases, they don't want to distribute people uh, uh, personalized numbers. In some cases, uh, uh, they believe that people will be afraid that government uh, will become a huge big brother. So you have to kind of design it properly mm. so that you make sure from I'll the beginning be that you won't. You. <laughs> and um, I think, you know, technologically, there is, uh, uh, we founded that already in f more than 15 years ago. So, you know, there is no country in the world that cannot do it 15 years mm. later. Uh, and, and by the way, we didn't actually find it, we copied it from the Finns. They, they just simply didn't, never, never used it themselves. So, <laughs> actually, yeah. it's a big secret. We, That's one we, of the we took it from the Finns and started <laughs> using that properly. <laughs> But anyways, I, I, uh, I think uh, this is something that we are actually trying to do with the e-residency card. We are handing them out uh, for Finns, for um, Croatians, for uh, Americans, and, and we kind of trying to give them the teaser what it would be like. Of course, we can, as Estonian um, uh, society, we can provide less, society, uh, less uh, services for a Finn that, that the Finnish government could, but you know, just kind of increase the appetite. And I think... Uh, uh, the end goal should be that, that globally, just like we use credit cards uh, or, or something similar, mm. we should also use digital identification because you know, showing passport to a teller, uh, that's, that's not a very secure way of identifying <laughs> you in the 21st century, let's be and honest. And it's overkill. Hmm? And, but th this is something that we have somehow agreed to accept. Yeah. But you know, having an encrypted key that can be verified uh, is something that we consider insecure. That's not very logical. Yeah. I, I like the question, because I mean, that's something that, uh, what you mentioned, yeah, Finn started it, they screw it up totally, and, and you guys picked it up and mastered <laughs> I it. I didn't say that. No, no, I said it. I can say it, I'm a Finn, I can say it. And, and I'm proud, proud to say that too, because I mean, that's what happens when, you, when you're not thinking ahead, you know, like you should. Um, there's a lot of legacy that was there, you know, uh, when they started it. 
But I think that the Nordics can be a, a, a tremendous, you know, poster Absolutely. market for all this. And, and let's make, if we make it happen here in the Nordics, mm -hmm. everybody will follow. This is the mm -hmm. easiest. Let's get it out and, and, you know, all the Nordic countries, you know, mm -hmm. join up and, you know, let's make it happen. And, you know, that's after that, you cannot stop it. Yeah. Um, and then it comes, you know, it's not the, my, you know, scanned, <laughs> yeah. you know, kind of a signature, but it's, it's a true digital sig signature. And we actually have a roadmap with the Finns, uh, how to have uh, one by one the uh, digital services working across the Gulf. Yeah. So once we can have it, uh, then I hope that the other countries yeah. see that this will be possible for them as well. Yeah, we'll probably get the Norwegians and Danes first, and then Swedes will follow the latest. But, uh, you know, <laughs> any Swedes on the ground here? Uh, there is one there. Yeah. There is okay, one so, day. Um, question? There is one there. <laughs> Got one. Yes. Um, oh, there's one. Sorry. I'm a civil yes. servant from the Netherlands, the municipality of Utrecht. And I was actually asked the exact same question a week ago. Uh, can you do a project on digital voting? <laughs> and um, um, my question is, where do, what's the easiest way for me to steal the technology of Estonia? <laughs> talk, to, talk to Tavi and you know, you're, you're all good. <laughs> He'll well, sell uh, it to you. Just very briefly, the many countries consider using uh, you know, Excel when you count the votes, uh, digital uh, voting, but that's not. <laughs> that's not the digital voting that, that we... Uh, consider or nor is going to a booth that a has some uh, lights on it. That's not also not digital voting in the, in the Estonian context. But what uh, is the precondition uh, in, uh, to have this kind of eye voting that we have in Estonia ever since 2005 is that you can identify yourself securely online. And once you have that, mm. then <coughs> any transaction can be done, including voting, including financial transaction, whatever. Only two risky ones cannot be done, getting married and buying property. Okay. So that you have to show up for getting married. <laughs> kind of okay. old school. For now. All right. Yeah, for yeah. now. <laughs> Almost 30 years married, so yeah, I'm not con considering to do it again. So yeah, I'm still there. Yeah. When we're talking about digital economies and globalization and digital transformation, there's a threat in losing uh, uh, cultural uh, differences, mm. linguistic differences, tradition. Um, is this a problem, I guess, is my first question, and, and, and if it is, then what can we do about it? Um, and if it's not, maybe it's something that we shouldn't be scared of. Uh, maybe globalization and kind of becoming a little more similar in all of our countries and, and cultures isn't a bad thing. But mm. I'd like your thoughts. So, I personally don't think that there's a threat of losing that. Um, I live in a country with 11 official languages. Um, when I managed my IT team, I had 14 different languages and different cultures using different local and international services there. Um, there is a generational trend that obviously, you know, I think we're part of the boomer de generation, so we have certain preference <laughs> of culture and music we like to listen to, and it's not going to mix with what a millennial does. Do you find yeah. that certain generational <laughs> habits are forming globally like music and entertainment? But when it comes to cultural nuances, um, you give the same people the same tools, they're going to apply it within their cultural context. So I don't believe that it's just going to, to change. And also coming back to education and, and um, especially in digital skill sets, mm -hmm. there's huge opportunities for universities to go virtual. And in South Africa, the education system is past the point of broken. Um, but once we can bring more cost-effective connectivity into other global models where they can teach these digital skills, we will start seeing different changes as well. So people will connect, and today through WhatsApp <coughs> and all the different chats, the kids are connecting in any case. So I don't think it's a threat, I think it's going to create opportunities like we've never seen. The digital services in Africa has a complete different flavor of how people use it to how people would say even use payment services in, in the States or, or Europe. And it's, it's pretty much localized with how they do commerce and trade in the physical environment that they live in. I totally agree with that. I think people are starting to learn a lot more about other cultures as opposed to the cultures getting washed out. If you could think about 20 years ago, I mean, like, there just wasn't that opportunity to have a friend halfway around the world and interact mm -hmm. with them and you know, learn from their experiences and their culture. I think, it's, I, I think it has the potential to really enrich humanity if that's a bit too lofty to say, but I think it does, because 
that we're not siloed anymore. You know, we're, we've got our digital selves and we've got, I'm Irish, but you know, I consider myself a citizen of the world. I think everyone else here does too. And uh, you can be a citizen of the world without mm. leaving your house, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the no. fact is that it is threat and opportunity. If you look, it depends how it's managed. Mm -hmm. But uh, today we have in markets for major languages translators, which means uh, digital translators, which means you will not need to know English to talk to your colleagues on the other side of the world. Up to now, that was maybe the biggest threat that everybody will have mm -hmm. to speak English, but it's just a matter of time. And by the way, why do we have uh, keyboards on, on computers? Because this speech recognition technology is not yet there, mm -hmm. but it's a question of yeah. year. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. happening there, and that will be probably the major preventer of losing the languages. And by the way, you will be able to store all your cultural things on, on the internet, mm -hmm. what Estonia is doing. Mm -hmm. So new generations will be able to hear how it was, a language mm -hmm. was spoken 20, 50, 100 <coughs> years ago. Mm -hmm. So both, it works both ways. So we're running out of time and, and, and um, uh, shutting this, this panel down. Uh, I like the question. I mean, uh, my personal experience there was that, you know, moving to Silicon Valley, uh, I became more Finn than that I was before. <laughs> and then I became Nordic, mm -hmm. which I didn't have that strong identity. So I have those and then kind of, I'm Californian then. That's the third one. So, you know, so, so it, it, it kind of enriches what we talked about, but also I found the things in me that I didn't know that I have, uh, the, the, the finish in me. Um, and because I, I didn't consider that important, but there it kind of became important. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for the panelists. Let's have a round of applause for these guys. And Thank you.